No. Hey guys, it's Robert Gardner with the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. I've got a uh, good friend, Josh Terry here. He actually lives in Austin, so we decided to use the, the internet and computer to communicate with each other. <laughs> Josh, what were you going to say? I was just, just going to ask if you, if you wanted uh, me to, to lead off with some of the, the things that I, I had idea-wise, or did you have something in mind? Oh, I'm, I'm real, yeah. I'm, I'm, so I find it interesting over time. I'm noticing the more people I work with, both in podcasts and video, people are very uncomfortable. And I think what it is, is like their sense of perfection. Yeah. Like I, I posted a video for a Kristen. I used a uh, shortcut and then used uh, some other software. And then I sent her the video. It took me 30 minutes to make it because I've learned how to use some software. And she said, well, I don't really like the face I made at the last part of the video. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> it's like uh, sweeping your floor and finding a hair, one hair in the corner. I'm like, really? Like, dude, this is small potatoes. Like my complexion, oh, it isn't the best. I got a mole. Like that's too much. So for me, I tend to be very laissez faire and very like easygoing. So like if we say, hey, we're going to talk about technology and we completely change and talk about something else, I just don't care. Like, I can speak extemporaneously about things I don't know anything about. So it's easy for me to just put things together and allow you to have the floor, essentially. So what's going on? Well, I'm working on a book. And the book is a concept of learning theory. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm using these conversations to kind of explore some, some of the, the aspects of it. And I thought today it might be interesting to go over some of the problems. Yeah. So uh, these, these are, I'm just real quick going to say some, some of the things that, that I've, been, I've been thinking about that I, th I think this concept is relevant to. Is one is like hustle culture. It's great. Yeah. There's a lot of positive aspects to it, but there's like a dark side mm -hmm. of kind of guilt that comes from not living up to it. <clears throat> and it's unsustainable when it's misunderstood. Yeah. And another aspect that ties right into that is people are living with a massive amount of anxiety. Yeah. Let's 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 start with that. There's, there seems to be a problem these days with those things. I'm I'm talking to more and more people that are capable of getting something done and struggling constantly, even if they achieve something fairly significant in their lives. And what I'm noticing with somebody that's at a high level of success or they're just beginning, there's a, there's a mistranslation that they do of the hustle culture, which is easy to do. Most people mistranslate it to, you know, work, 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 hustle all the time, never stop. And they push constantly. And when you push constantly, like when you're constantly redlining behavior, you never have a chance to heal. You never have a chance to recover. You can get stronger in some ways, but your, your overall self, I've found, tends to be worn down over time. And the, a really obvious example of this is the bodybuilder. The bodybuilder cannot get in the gym and then max out and then max out the next day and max out the next day and expect them to grow muscle mass. They actually lose muscle mass if they do that. And people that are sort of entranced by the hustle culture, they try to do that. And I think that they get diminishing returns over time where they actually, instead of becoming more successful from doing this, they run out of steam and become less capable. And tying into this is that there's a really, really good reason, I think, why people, why people are, are, are automatically doing this. Because it's not just the social narrative. Hustle culture is new. Catholic guilt is not. Like, that shit's been around for a while. And we thought that we had to work hard to be better for a long, long time. And working hard to be, get better, of course, is 
a good thing when you say it just like that, but when it consumes your life to only push to be better, it, it takes away from other aspects of life. And the, the thing that ties into it is an aspect of learning, which is we are habit-forming creatures, and habits are formed very easily. So when we start to learn something, the very first experience is newness. And newness is anxiety-inducing, it's difficult, it's a struggle. And newness is hustle, it's push towards that, that, that new achievement. And that's the first thing, by definition, of what the learning process is that you have to do. But the second step is to sit with that thing and explore it. And that second step is one, it's not learned, two, it's not taught, and three, it's not instinctual. Because when you first experience something new, when you, when you first try something new and you go into that anxiety of struggle to try to be better, you succeed a little bit. Because, like, that's what happens. Like, you learn the rules of chess and you play your first game. Yay. You, you, learn, you learn how to throw the bowl, bowling ball down the bowling alley. Like, whatever it is, you learn something new. And when that happens, your reward systems fire. And from that point on, your habits are formed because their habits are formed by reward systems. And you, from that point on, you're, you're wired to look for new things and you're not wired to actually take something that you know and play with it and iterate on it. And I, I think that this is prevalent across any field where, where skill building is an option. I think the challenge is my, my first response when you talked about hustle is there's this, I think there's a misconception. The fact that we even have like a phrase like hustle culture. Yeah. I listen to a lot of Gary V floats through my feed. And I think a lot of people misinterpret stuff Gary says from an individual video because they're not looking at the overall picture. In the yeah. end, would me or anybody else, you included, would you encourage someone to work so hard they don't get sleep? Absolutely. And work so hard they destroy their relationships because they have no social contact. Oh, yeah. And oh, work, yeah. work so hard that they somehow jeopardize their health. Absolutely not. But the thing is, I think also the problem is people are looking at a sprint and not a marathon. The, the long-term goal, if you're a marathon runner, isn't to run a marathon every day. It's to train consistently, allow your body to condition itself, run miles and miles and miles so that when you finally decide to run the 26, I think, plus miles that it is a marathon, that your body can easily do that. That is a long-term thing. It's not something you, you know, shoot out in 20 seconds. You know, a big burst of exertion. I, I think one of the reasons I've been successful is I'm very determined. And then when I hit a stumbling block, I can get frustrated just like anybody else, but I tend to just put it aside and come back. The thing is, I just keep going for years and years and years. So like with you, Josh, we've had lots of conversations about software because people are describing me like I'm a tech worker now. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> because I just learned how to use, you know, Canva to do some basic graphic design. And I learned how to do, okay, yeah, here's Anchor. I can upload a, a file and then make a podcast. And then, oh, okay, I can use Canva to now make a graphic for the cover for that podcast that we upload on Anchor. It was just putting pieces together over time. I think other people look at it and say, well, Robert just, he works too much. And it's like, no, this is me. Like, I work to the level I want. Like when people start talking about work-life balance, I had a conversation with an apprentice and, and she said, oh, well, you know, I, I like to take weekends off so I can hang out with my boyfriend. And I'm like, sure. Like there was no, no shame, no denigration. No, I'm like, but 
they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what I do every day, work. If I'm not actively working on a client or actively teaching a class, I'm dealing with software and graphics and it's software integrations and Zapier and, you know, whatever else to try to build. But here's the thing. The hustle part is, does it fulfill your heart? I love it. I absolutely love it. I've had people tell me like, you're going to burn out. And I'm like, no, people burn out when they do shit they don't like. Working 40 hours a week at a job you hate for 30 years, that'll make you burn out. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing. And I want to be very clear. I'm pro hustle culture. I, I actually like it. I think it's a good thing. But it gets mistranslated. Like, like yes. you said, people that watch a couple of videos, they misunderstand the, what the real concept is behind it. And I mean, that's something that I admire about you is like you, you've learned these lessons better than I have at this point, which is when you get tired, you stop. Yeah. <laughs> which, which doesn't sound all that innovative when you, when you say it out loud, but damn, it makes a big difference in the world. Well, I mean, um, and a lot of people don't stop. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that concept and they only get stopped by external circumstances. The obvious version of this is getting sick, right? Yeah. There's people that don't stop working until they're ill, yeah. and then they start working again once they're better. They think that they were sick, and then they got it back up and started working. What actually happened was their body needed to rest, so it told the body that it was sick, and then you rested, and then you got up and went back to work. Yeah. So, I mean, you can live life that way, but I, th I think it's, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. And I, I think there's, there's a bunch of people that don't understand it. And the, 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 two, the two main things that, that I, well, I guess there's three. The, 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 the three main things that I think about with this is one, the, the habit forming thing that I described initially is the very action of starting something and pushing into it if you get a reward kick from it it makes you want to do it again yeah so so because of that we're wired to actually go towards anxiety we're wired to go towards something that is a push because we're going to try to get the reward kick again and, and then an, another one is guilt like we culturally have turned guilt into a, a, the most useless form that it can be in. So to me, guilt is a highly useful thing. Guilt is incredibly useful in a short-term scenario where you have done something badly that you could fix or do differently in the future. Guilt is excellent for that, and it's useless for almost anything else. And we've turned guilt into a sort of long-term thing where it's like, I'm just going to, you know, feel guilty about my lack of achievements until I've hit my six-month goals, you know. And that's turned into a sort of, like, self-dislike, uh, a, a self-hatred that when people stop, they notice it. And when you're working, you can you can let that that weight of guilt come off of you. You don't you can be distracted so that you don't notice it, that you don't feel good about yourself. But when you stop, there's no distraction to to hide the fact that you're not happy with your existence. And what one of the things I'd argue is that stopping is often harder than starting. For, for, for some people, people that have, people that are ambitious and want to push, stopping is often the more difficult part. So <clears throat> two things come to mind, and this is just my personal experience, poker and the way that poker taught me about business. So if I'm sitting down and playing, granted not for a lot of money, but nobody likes to lose money. 
sometimes you can uh, go tilt, you know, where somebody cracks a hand. I don't know, you got, you got a pair of aces and something happens and you lose because some guy th caught three twos or something. If I get angry and get upset and start making emotional decisions instead of rational decisions, it's very easy to just throw a bunch of money down a hole very quickly because you're angry, you're upset, you're responding emotionally to a logical statistical analysis. But if I put it away and then I come back later, clear. I also think of it in the same terms and I'll relate these, meditation. I might not reference it that way within yoga. I may not reference it that way in regards to breathing or I know that Josh, you have some background like Wim Hof. There's something about rooting yourself in your own anatomy and physiology. It's like you're able to step back from a very clear mental perspective to make better decisions, to make sometimes less emotional decisions, but at the same time, things that feel heart-centered. You know, you're, you're playing a guessing game in entrepreneurship around what you should and shouldn't do as far as where you should put your time and energy. What's the next thing in your business you should go for? How much time and energy should you put? Once I get to a point, and poker taught me this, once I get to the point where I'm tired, I'm making more emotional decisions based on how I feel instead of whether this is a good bet or not. And what I do is I say, hey man, listen, you've worked on all this software stuff in your business all day. Take a break. And here's what I do. I, I go sit down, do a couple yoga poses, stretch out, maybe have a snack, a little bit of tea. And I come sit back down and I'm much more mentally able of tackling the challenges. To me, it's that whole thing about longevity. It's not about one hand. It's not about one poker tournament. It's about the entire game of life. How do you win it as a marathon? Like my goal is to be 80, 85 years old, maybe 100 and check out. And basically be able to look back and think of all the friends, family, loved ones, all the people you helped with no regrets. A lot of people, they're just looking at, again, a single video, a single business decision, a single this, you know, they had a bad day. And it's like, don't allow one day out of 365, like ruin the rest. Especially if, again, you're making bad business decisions because you're being overly emotional or, or jeopardizing your mental, emotional, or psychological health. To me, it's very long. Like, to me, it's like, what's the downside of taking a break and, like, pondering, hey, is this a good decision before we do this? I don't see a downside to that sort of strategic thinking. There is no downside. And what I've found is that people don't see it that way. There isn't a downside and people don't realize it because they see danger. They see danger and shame and they get to notice how fearful they are of the future. When, when, when people stop, they tend to First, just feel bad that they stopped. Even if they told themselves that they need a break, a lot of times, they run into this problem where they, they just can't cope with it. And I mean, the way you described it, I think it is, is the right way to go. I think that works. And I don't think there is a downside. But with the people that I, I've worked with over and over again, it's, it's almost a, an impossibility at the beginning. And what I found is we view rest as a guilty pleasure. We view rest as, and I, I don't mean you and me, I mean, I'm saying like this, this, this problem is, is we find ourselves viewing rest as the pleasant thing, the cookie and the cookie jar. But the reality is a guilty pleasure is something that you do even if you don't want to do it. And people that are ambitious and working really hard, they tend to not want to rest, which means that it's kind of the opposite of a guilty pleasure. It's actually 
a righteous sacrifice. It's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to rest. And when people that, and I'm, and I'm talking about a particular psychology type, right? Because everybody's different. There are some people that all they ever want to do is lay around, for sure. But I, I've noticed there's a, there's a really large section of the culture that really does want to go get something done, and they're excited about doing it. And that group, they think that rest is a soft, gentle, nice, recuperative, fun thing. They describe it that way. But in actuality, they don't have a desire to do it. So because of that, they're putting it in the wrong box. Because it's like with the cookie and the cookie jar analogy. Like if it's a guilty pleasure, well, if it's a guilty pleasure, then eventually you'll do it no matter what, right? Because eventually you like it and you want to do it. So they, they view rest as like this thing that I like, and eventually I'll do it no matter what because I like it so much. But it's like that is not the case because you don't like rest. A lot of people don't like rest. They want to push because they, they feel bad when they rest. So what I've been saying lately is for some people, you want to think of rest as one of the more difficult things you could do. Like rest is the task. Rest is, rest is the job. And work is the play. Because, well, you work all day long. Work is the thing that you want to do. And yeah, you can use the excuse of like, yeah, well, I need to pay the bills and this and that and the other. But the, the reality is, is like most people have wired their reward systems to get to the point where they want to push. So if you want to push, then pulling back and resting is the task. And you have to turn it into almost like, you, ha you have to classify it in, in your mind as the right thing or you won't do it, I have found. And then when people classify it correctly, they realize, oh wait, no, this is something that I, I don't want to do. But I, if I tell myself to do it and I recognize it, I don't really want to do it, I can muster the discipline to do it. Because most people think that they need to apply. Most most people that are in this 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 particular culture, most people want to think they need to apply their discipline to their work. But the reality is, like you take people like you and me, we are happy to apply our discipline to our work. We want to make the best things we can possibly make. And we will happily invest as much of our energy as we possibly can into creating that thing. So there's sometimes more desire on that end than there is on the rest side. And I, I found that this, this seems to result in people being really drained and not being able to operate at the level that they could. I mean, I'm going to say something as cliched as balance, but <clears throat> I also think that some people's balance is different than you and I. Just oh, like yeah. just like some people's diet is different than you and I. Some people's, so most people's number diet. of hours a day is different than you and I. I. What I think happened to me in school is they tried to make you conform into this box that biologically I just didn't fit in. I'm not a morning person. We set this at 1 p.m. and I'm like, great, I'll have coffee, I'll be fully awake because I might wake up at 11. For other people, they're like, oh my God, he sleeps the whole day away. But it's like, yeah, but I might be working till three or four in the morning. But if I don't go according to my normal biorhythms, are my biorhythms wrong compared to everybody else? No, they're just different. The problem is, when you're trying to force yourself into a box that doesn't fit. If I talk about yoga and somebody says, well, I don't like yoga. I don't tell them, well, you should do yoga anyway. I don't like meditation. Well, you should meditate anyway. It's like, no, you should go jog if that's what does it for you. Like, who am I to say what's going to work best for you? The other part is I'm big on entrepreneurship. Some people think I think everybody should be entrepreneurs. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Some people need a 40-hour work week where they have security and a sense of 
value that comes out of performing that job and then going home and having a separate life. I'm not that person, yeah. but I don't think everybody should be doing what I'm doing. I think there's also a point where people are making poor decisions when it comes to, I'm going to do everything myself. It's like, listen, at some point, if you're an entrepreneur, you should probably hire somebody to do some graphic design for you. <laughs> at some point, like, I don't go build my own car. I let Honda do that. <laughs> you know, I had a conversation with somebody jokingly because I'm kind of tight with money and I need black pepper and I buy the whole peppercorns because the whole peppercorns are tastier and then also it's probably a little bit less expensive. And then I was like, well, you could just pick it up when you're at store. And I'm like, I could order right now on Amazon. And then I was like, well, like I wanted to do like price comparison. I'm like, bro, if you're spending time doing price comparison on whole peppercorns, I mean, let's say it's 50 cents difference. Are you really saving money? <laughs> just, just order it. <laughs> it's like, you got to drive around for gas. So gas is 20 cents more a gallon at one place or another. Does that really make a big difference on an American budget? A lot of times it doesn't. And, and that's the thing. It's like you, you got to figure out what battles to fight. And I can't tell everybody how to yeah. do this specifically. It's really a matter of when people talk about like burnout, I think burnout is from people who are pushing too hard they're not listening to their own body signals. And the thing that I would, I guess, stress is I think you make poorer business decisions in that state, not better ones. Great. The longevity Great. is being very mentally clear and then being able to go at it. I will always ask students, and these are typically massage therapists, they're like, well, you know, what should I do with my business? And I'll go, what do you want to do? And they think I'm just asking about their business. And I'm like, no, 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 life. They're like, well, I want to move to Bali. And I'm like, okay, let's go. Like, if that's what yeah. you want to do, that's your dream, man. Don't let me squash that, even if that's not my dream. Like, there's nothing worse to me than somebody working a job they hate, being around people they don't like, and just wasting their life when we have all these options, all this freedom, all this commercial wealth, where we can actually make choices that inspire us. I love talking to people about, I don't know, some guy has a job, he works 40 hours a week, he's not totally happy with it, he wants to start his own business. I'm like, great, what do you want to do? And they're like, I want to sell cookies. And I could sit and have a conversation with him for an hour about, okay, how are you going to make cookies? How are you going to transport cookies? Who's your target market? What kind of cookies? What are the ingredients? What's your marketing niche? Because I love the entrepreneurial process. I love seeing people come alive. That's the complete opposite of somebody who's tired, not well-rested, not mentally, not excited. That, that's me when I was a kid coming home from school because I'm like, man, they made me get up at like 7.30 and then they put me in an algebra class at first period and this is not, that was not working for my biorhythms. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, it's, it's not working within the, your, your capacity. It's not working within your abilities. And it's, it's the excellence and I mean, I, I want to point out, like, ahead of this, like, you absolutely have to learn new things. That's part of the process. Like, you and I are learning new things at a terrifying rate. It's, it's happening all the time. But, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but at the same time, the vast majority of what we're doing, we're playing within our capacity. We're, we're doing something. Thing that we can do that we can explore and have fun with. and that's that's what makes us able to keep going I think because God I've, I've worked outside of my capacity many times and it's never gone well I mean I was a workaholic at 20 I, I'd, I'd say I'd say by well I was probably a workaholic by the time I was 18 by the time I was 21, I was probably borderline anorexic. The drive to like try to push to be better is not the whole equation when it comes to achievement. 
achievement also has this area in it that is exploration and joy and and fun and it's kind of repetitive and iterative and like we talk about this inside of your practice when you teach people things but one of the things that that is so often done is like you, you teach somebody a progression right they, they learn a series of things that they are supposed to do and when when they ask what to do next they go hey what's the next progression and you know your response i i think is your, your gut response is something along the lines of no 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 now you're supposed to use that progression now now you're supposed to take that progression that that was that progression was a communication of a concept you're supposed to take that progression and apply that progression in your practice so that you can figure out where it's actually relevant because teaching is a teaching is kind of an act of efficiency by, by necessity because there's so much to know and if, if you've spent 10 years 20 years on a subject and somebody comes to you for an hour of learning that two hours of learning what can you really do for them? It, it's very, very difficult to consider that concept. Uh, the answer is you can do a lot. But, but one of the things that we do in response to this when we're teaching is we boil things down into something that can be applied to many things. And when you teach a progression, inside of that progression is a series of steps that can be used you know, thousands of different ways. And what's really cool about that is that if you know that one progression and you understand that your job now is to explore it, utilize it, play with it, move it around, then there's a lot less pressure on you psychologically than to go learn something new, learn the next progression. But it's very difficult to break through that. And it's it's the same thing that I have to break I had to break through with my students in music, which was improvisation, the same concept. Is you don't need to learn the next 20 notes. You need to learn, you know, these three or four notes, repeat them until they're boring, so that they're easy, and then play with them to make them interesting. Like it, it's it's get to get to that point where you start entertaining yourself with the activity, and <clears throat> I think this is a I think this is something that when when it's done this way, it's much more strengthening and much less exhausting than trying to always push for the next thing. It for some reason what came to mind was memorization and the focus on memorization in school, whereas problem, yeah. problem solving is a much better skill. And yes. the solution is like, well, what's the answer? It's like, well, it depends on what the problem is. Like, that's life. But memorization has a decrease in value, I guess also as we have so much access to information at the tips of our fingers now. To me, the meditation and yoga, when it came to poker, when it came to entrepreneurship, those two practices, meditation and yoga, became a springboard for everything else. And here's what happened to my uh, productivity. And here's what happened to my mindset. It, like Other people were like, dude, what is wrong with that dude? And I'm like, I figured it out. <laughs> like for me, I mean, within my own you know, parameters, like the process of sitting back, figuring out range of motion in a joint, figuring out comfort, figuring out, okay, use the muscles, but like don't compromise your nervous systems or your anatomy's integrity, became this filter into everything else in my life about balance. And I, and I think that sounds really boring, right? Like balance, oh, yay. What we wanted to have is a balanced life. It sounds really boring, but when you figured out for you what the balance was between work and play, 
like I would talk to people about entrepreneurship and they're, and they're like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, okay, listen, this, this is the two things. Usually what makes money and what's the most fun? <laughs> because if I could figure those two things out, that was the thing that was so gripping to my heart that I could, I could go constantly. I could get up, have coffee and just grind it. Like there's no, I don't get up in the morning, clock in. There's not a thing on my wall to go, ching, ching. <laughs> I'm working now. Like I just do it whenever I feel like it, which is for the bulk of the day because you're working on something that's a dream. I, I think part of the problem that we're having is we went through an educational system that was not designed in any way, shape or form for entrepreneurship or for dream building. It was built for industry workers who were going to work in a company making widgets in a repetitive way due to industrialization. Yes. Memorization is step one. Uh, it's, it's like, there's, there's a lot of steps in the process. And, and, and memorization is step one, because memorization is absorbing the new material. And in order to do anything with new material, you do have to absorb it. But it very quickly loses its value if that's all, you, all, you, all that you're doing. The, one of the best classes I ever took in college, back when I was borderline anorexic, so much fun, was a course called Aesthetics, Music Aesthetics, by, taught by just a, a brilliant professor. It, it, it was the coolest thing, because he went and he pissed off pretty much every single art student in the room. It was great. He, he, he walked into the room and he put a one-page printout of definitions of art on every desk. It, it was just a full page. I think it was on both sides of just like, you know, just, just a bunch of, you know, Nietzsche, uh, a, a bunch of different philosophers and artists, different, different people that had views on art, what they believed art was, what the definition of art was. And it was so funny to watch the room as he laid these out on everybody's desk because, you know, everybody in the room is like 18 to 20 years old. They're, you know, fresh out of taking all their, their philosophy and humanities and all of these courses. And they've learned that nothing means anything and everything is shades of gray and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden they start howling. They're like, this definition is bullshit. This, you're making us, you know, lock ourselves into these boxes. And it, it was the funniest thing how, like, it was just this immediate negative reaction to one page put on their desk. And he said, look, I don't care what you think about the definitions of art. Your job is to memorize that page so that next week we can actually have a conversation about it. And where public schools failed us is they would put a page on our desk and they would say, memorize that page. And we'd say, why? And they'd say, because you need it. And of course, we would rebel and we would forget it because that's bullshit. But this guy said, if you memorize this, it will be fixed in your mind well enough that we can coherently break them down, take them apart, put them back together, and turn them into something we want to utilize for ourselves. And that, that's why I say memorization is, is step one. And I mean, you, you do this in your teaching where you teach somebody a progression. I do this in my teaching where, you know, I teach them a set of phonographs in, in whatever subject we're working on. And I, I think this is across the board, one of those kind of across the board things where you have to, you have to internalize something. That step one is almost valueless. It, it's almost nothing. It, it's a, it's a computer program. It's, it's, putting data into the mind and just sticking it there. The value comes from what you do afterwards. 
step two of exploration, iteration, improvisation, you know, coming up with new ideas. And also, also another thing, you, you were talking about balance and, and how it's, it's feels like kind of a boring word. And I, I agree. It's, it's like a, it's a hard one to talk about sometimes because it has that sort of connotation. I, I always like to say that when I, when I bring it up is a, a, having a balanced life also includes having balanced amounts of insanity. Like, like you have to have crazy in order to have a fully balanced life because if you're not factoring something into your life, then it's not balanced. So it's like you want to balance out to have, you know, a uh, sort of stability and the result of that is oftentimes, you know, having some kind of neutral, maybe boring elements in your life, but also it means you're balancing the crazies. And you're having extreme days, you're having extreme experiences, you're having extreme ups and downs occasionally. I, th I think that is part of the balanced life. Well, but, uh, but yeah. So I, here's the thing, everybody, this is Buddhism, man. Uh, to me, I look at this, and again, these things factored into every facet of my life, not just like spiritual life or business. It was like in Buddhism, there's attraction and aversion. Everybody's attracted to food. Everybody's attracted to pretty people. Everybody's attracted to nice, new clothes, new things, fun. Now, how do you deal with aversion? Death, famine, disease, decay, COVID. Because that's not fun. But the thing is, it's like, it's all a facet of like how we deal with life because you have to deal with those extremes. And I think the way that you learn to deal with those extremes has a profound impact on the relationships you have with other people that funnels into our businesses as entrepreneurs. Like, how do you handle it when, I don't know, things aren't going well? <laughs> how do you treat people? How do you communicate with them? How do you this? How do you that? I think it's a, a good skill. And I think as a kid, you know, like little babies, I don't have any communication skills. They don't even talk yet. They just cry. And then the parents got to figure out, okay, do they need to be changed? Do they need food? Do they need milk? Do they need, you know, like playtime? Do they need touch and attention? But we learn communication to be able to figure out what it is we can do, not only in the good times, because everybody can deal with the attraction, but how you deal with the aversion is the part that really interests me. How do you deal with the haters online? How do you deal with being reported to the state board? How to deal with clerical and taxes? The, 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 the aversion part, the hard stuff, is often what really is the sandpaper in life that makes people who they are, in my opinion. Anybody can do the easy stuff. Yeah, that actually, that, that ties in perfectly with the things I've been thinking about in the book, which is essentially it's an argument to go and explore your aversions and to, to become more comfortable with them. And it's, it's, I'm presenting it a really counterintuitive way where I'm saying, hey, look, rest and recuperation, working on fundamentals, exploring things that you already know, doing things that are kind of easy, that's the thing that ambitious people actually have an aversion to. I mean, I mean, there, there's you know far worse versions of this out out in the world, but I, I think there's one also inside of just the day to day life of people that are trying to achieve is is they get the attraction from driving towards their goals, and but they aren't willing to, to look at their aversions and they don't understand what their aversions are. Yeah, no, and they, uh, they have a natural push in America specifically. I think people are very short term. Like I want my peppercorns now, I'll go to Amazon and order it. And Jeff Bezos has somehow yeah. provided that infrastructure. But- Thanks Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> but, you know, dealing with, and I want to say my wife, but I'm divorced now, so I'll tell you how that worked out. But it's like, how do you deal with that when you're having a problem with your significant other? Ah, because to me, I look at people when I'm dating now, I'm like, okay, how do they deal with adversity? 
because yeah, everybody can go have a good date and we had a good date and good food and it was nice and we connected it was so great but how do they deal with i lost my job i'm broke how do they deal with my car broke down do they treat me like like adversity how people deal with adversity and how people deal with challenges is the real make or break to me it really tells me something about people and i think the Shoot. good go go ahead go ahead the real the real thing in life is learning how to deal with that entrepreneurship like i do this all the time i go okay how do i feel about something that's one thing but then in a business sense how do i get it done it doesn't matter it means two shits what i think about my business it matters what the customers think about your business You got to you got to look at it rationally. Adversity. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, adversity is adversity is kind of one of the big, the big ones in life. It's one of the big teachers. One of the big tests. It's a big thing to learn from. I also, I think I started kind of clicking once I started learning more about Eastern thought. I, I think that was a that was a big step for me as well. I. I my my first influence there instead of Buddhism was Taoism, and uh, you know I grew up with classic classic Western conservative police family etc. But, but when I when I started studying those concepts of the push and pull and the, the focusing on the fundamentals, that that was a big one for me. Is is that those those simplistic things learning to, to, to focus on the most basic elements of life, to, to learn from them. That started moving me forwards in a big way. The, there's something about pulling back and focusing on those simple things that allows you to see the drivers, see the push and pull that happens in the world and in your life. The, the, the attractors and the repulsors, the, 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 the pleasures and the suffering, you start to see it more clearly. And, and it's, it's such an interesting thing when, when you can gain an appreciation for those things that you find more difficult. I mean, you know, that, you, you know uh, that's a, a big part of what I've been going through as I've been studying the cold exposure is, I mean, that's a, such a difficult thing for me. And I've been working on it for like three years. And I've, I've gained so much from the process. And it's, it's so interesting to get to that point where these things that are difficult can have a sort of sweetness to them. There, there's, a, there's a way you can appreciate them. And it just it kind of blows my mind. I remember the first time I got rejected after I kind of like loosened up a little bit yeah. and I, and I gotten back in touch with myself because I just gotten so locked up when I was younger that I was just totally out of touch with my, my sensations, my emotions, just running away from you know, anything that was suffering as quickly as I could, trying to get comfortable. And I, and I started practicing these things, that this awareness and letting myself explore the, the uncomfortable things. It was so funny. Like, I was, I was driving home, like, obviously, you know, disappointed because it's like rejection. It's like bummer. But at the same time, there was a part of me that was like kind of having a good time. That was like, oh, that's what that feels like. Huh, that's that hurts, but that's kind of cool. You know, it's 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 fascinating how that happens. And I think I think you can be way more functional when you can kind of accept it as just kind of a, a part of the life experience. Yeah, I mean, it goes into so many different areas. And again, that that thing about attraction and aversion. When I hit on this as a concept, it was like. 
it, it was inside Buddhism, by the way, but it was like, it made so much sense to me about how people deal with life. And so many people in America, we love attraction. We love youth. We love virility. We love food. We love pleasure. Those things are easy, totally easy. Everybody can do that. What do you do when it's bad? How do you respond when you're rejected? How do you deal with, man, I, you know, I made a good bet and I lost. It's like, well, poker is a game of chance as well. Like, this is statistical analysis. It's kind of like, well, I did this thing in my business and it didn't work. And it's like, great. And they're like, but I lost money. And I'm like, I mean, in the short term. So are you going to do it again the yeah. exact same way and lose more money? It's like, no, man, you did something and now you extrapolate from that and you have more information now you make a better choice and now you make it better and now you make it better i think the lack of sleep the lack of personal care the lack of social construct of like re focus on relationships leads to a sort of perfectionism and perfectionism is like dude i deal with this with students now because i'm, I'm working with some apprentices and i see it in them they're like, no, the video, I don't like the text. We got it, I don't like the little box. Like, you know, people are going to judge me. My skin is all broken out. And I'm like, you're worried about a, what a bunch of losers on the internet think about your complexion? But what it is, is, is like this perfectionism has been ingrained in them, even more specifically, in my case, as women. Because women are judged on how they look. And they have to deal with that now because they're making video. And I can see them, like, we're getting ready to film something. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? And they're like, well, we're doing our makeup and getting our clothes perfect. And I'm like, yo, I'm, you know, I'm wearing a t-shirt. So what? Let's go. But I have a different mental set that I have to help them work through. Because I'm doing some of their graphic design or some of their video stuff now, They've got all this feedback about how they want stuff to look, which I've got to kind of work with them on. But it's not just the video. What it is, is their sense of perfectionism. Them wanting it to come through is perfect. Them wanting it to come through is like, again, what are you attracted to and what do you have an aversion to? I think, in my experience with video production in particular, I think people actually respond more to its imperfection in a positive way. Wow, Josh is just like me. He's a normal guy. The audio wasn't perfect, they had a crackle. The video wasn't perfect, he needs a better webcam, or, or in my case, a better webcam. Those little things are actually what people focused on. I had to think about it, because I remember uh, Psyche Truth at one point, there was a video of Psyche Truth that went viral because the video editor somehow missed this, there was a, I don't, I never saw it by the way. There was a video and in the background, you could see the cat puking. They're performing this nice soothing massage. It's perfectly edited 4K <laughs> and in the background <laughs> and it hit like the front page of Reddit because of that. And that's the thing, like you can't, you would never plan for that. They certainly didn't plan for it. That video had been up for a while and somebody just noticed the cat puking in the background, but People notice the flaws, in a way, more than they do something else. So when I speak and I flub a word, I just keep going. But I've learned to do this over time because it's too much time for me to go in and try to edit that out and change it and tweak it and make it perfect to make me sound like the most eloquent speaker ever. No, I'm me. Like, I flub words, man. Some days I'm not my best. The challenge is how do I deal with not being my best. Adults learn how to forego short-term pleasure for long-term profitability. Like children do whatever they want whenever they want. Adults say, no, it's time to pay the taxes. No, it's, it's time to do the accounting. The accounting's not fun, but this has to be dealt with. There's so many layers where I feel like people's sense of perfectionism in particular is a huge obstacle to their ongoing success. People don't want to paint. Like in school, I was not a very good artist. But you have to 
fail in a sense. You have to do something poorly before you can do it well. I feel like people's sense of perfectionism is a huge obstacle to them. Yeah, I mean, perfectionism nearly destroyed me. It's 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 a uh, it's a rabbit hole. It's it's a rabbit hole with no end because nothing's perfect. That means that you can play that game forever and and never get out. It's it's it can become just incredibly toxic and poisonous. It's it, I, I I struggled with it on so many different levels for years, and I mean. To this day, I'm still, you know, struggling in many places, and all of the places where I've succeeded, it's because I've let go to some degree. It's, I've, I've some degree said, ah, fuck it, let's just give this a shot. Dude. And it's 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 so powerful to get to that point where you can. And the danger is, uh, or sorry, the, the, I want to go back a little bit. You mentioned like. The, the fear of the failure and, and, and you know, yeah. making the mistakes and all of that. And it's, it's so interesting that there's, there's a, it's, it's absolutely right. And then there's, there's a danger to it. And the, the danger is in which, which outlook you, you take. In, in the, uh, the forever powerful words of pretty woman, <laughs> if, they tell you a whore, if, if they call you a whore long enough, you start to believe it. It's it's such a powerful line because it 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 emphasizes the concept that you know repetition reinforces what you believe, and a lot of times when somebody tries something and they fail at it. They see repetition on something that they thought was right that ended up to be wrong. And that reinforces to them that they aren't capable, that, that, that they're incorrect. And the and, and you know that's very, very destructive. And the flip side of that is really excellently exhibited in a tech company, actually. So a tech company that's halfway to a billion dollars already, so they have a huge cash reserve and they're ready to go and they they know what they're basically trying to do. They just need to figure out how to do it. They will burn millions upon millions of dollars making mistakes. And when you ask them what happened, they'll say, we were just testing. Yeah. That wasn't a failure. We were looking for information. And they're correct. Yep. So it's it's a, really a viewpoint thing. And if you let yourself be reinforced by 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 the, the experience in a way that says something about your value, where where it's 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 like right. This thing went wrong, you failed. This thing went wrong, you failed. This thing went wrong, you failed. Over time, you start to believe it. But if instead, you understand that you are testing, and each failure is a new piece of information, that's an entirely different structure to live by. It can just shoot you to the moon. I know that I personally in business, I will get into anxiety because I'm doing needless speculation about, well, what are people going to buy? Well, I don't know. Let's think about it. Let's spend weeks. But I don't know. We don't know what people are going to buy. It's like, listen, unless you're doing something in your business that you can't change later, package it the way you think they want it and see. And if it didn't work, change it. Ask them, like you're you're an entrepreneur, you have a product or service. Ask your customers, what do you guys think? I sell salamis. I make artisanal salamis. Like, do you want the spicy or the not spicy? Do you want this? Do you want that? And it's like, do you want a mix box? And they all go, I want a mix box. It's like, so sell them what they want. The packaging, like I can spend tons of time like 
needless speculation, by the way, when all you have to do is take your best guess, make sure it's something you can come back from. Don't, you know, I got a $10,000 budget. Okay, well, don't blow the whole budget. Just test it $500 and see what happens. You can recover from $500. If you blow your whole load at 10 grand, you're going to have some business problems. That's where it's like those small tests tell you what the, the marketplace wants. The needless like speculation, because we'd like it if it were perfect and we'd like it if we made the right decision every time. It's interesting to me because people will start to talk about regret. Like what business stuff do you regret? And I'm like, not making enough mistakes basically. Because doing something gave me information. It either worked or it didn't. And both of those are almost equally valuable. Because what worked, you do again, and what didn't work, you go, hmm, let's change it. Why didn't it work? Hmm. And you get pattern recognition so you could keep pushing the business forward. Yeah, when people uh, ask me what, what I would have done differently in college, I, I'd say I would have gotten drunk more. <laughs> more parties. <laughs> and why is that? Experiences. They're incredibly valuable. But, but the, this, this idea of trying things to see if they work without the heavy weight of perfectionism weighing it down, it's, it's so much less pressure. People that, that think that things have to be perfect, they see the world through different lenses. It, it feels like failure isn't an option. And it ties into poverty mindset, I think. Because, I mean, poverty mindset is this, this, this concept of, I mean, I mean, there's lots of different facets to it, but one is there's not enough to go around. And you only got a couple of chances, so you better do well or you're fucked. And I think that's a big part of where perfectionism comes from. Because, I mean, there, there's other, you can get to perfectionism from many different alley roads. Lack of resources. So I Interesting. Of I, don't, I don't think I've thought about it that way. I'll continue with that. Yeah, so when people don't have resources, or they don't believe that they have resources, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing in this case, they... They conserve them because, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna need this, right? So there's also in, endemic spending that goes on in inside the poverty mindset, but that's for a different reason. That's because people spend to feel rich. But but but, but this thing is there's not enough. I need I need to 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 hang on to what I have with every every you know bit that I can, and then. If I'm going to risk it, I'd better risk it on something good, which means that that risk had better be the perfect risk. And we know that there is no perfect risk. That's like a, it's almost oxymoronic. It's not a thing. But, but when we feel that our, our resources are precious, then the, the tragedy of losing a resource on something that you could have done better feels more painful because you're like, oh my God, I, you know, I barely had anything and, you know, maybe I, I didn't think clearly enough or, or think hard enough preparing for this attempt that I was about, about to make, this risk that I was about to take. And I think the way out of it is, I mean, the way to become, the way to become wealthy, the way to get rich, like if you want to get really rich, the way you do it is you become more capable of risk over time. Because there's no big money without some risk. And, and I'm in no way like saying go gamble. That's not what it is. 
It, it's about taking measured risk that's well within your capability. Poker, man. Listen, I talk to people and they're like, that's gambling. And I'm like, oh, you must not play poker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> At least not the way I play. <laughs> like, like, don't get me wrong. There's chance. It is, it is a game of chance fundamentally, but No Limit Hold'em in particular is the sweet spot. The reason it's the Cadillac of poker is because it's the yeah, perfect like, match between you, emotion and risk management, mathematics, and statistics. Do you gamble better? And, and you might answer yes because of your personality, but it, if you do, it's rare. Do you gamble better when you have less, less chips in front of you? So there's, there's bankroll management. What happens is, is as you're at that tournament and you're building a, a, a stack, you can take more risk. You can play yeah. a wider range of cards yeah. because... That's the thing. So yeah. people with a full bankroll and people with barely any bankroll often have the hardest time. Yeah. Because somebody with a full bankroll has a lot to lose. And somebody with a small bankroll has everything to lose. Yeah. And both of those are things that people don't want. So I really think that perfectionism, one of the one of the one of the dark back alleyways to perfectionism is is poverty mindset. Because when you when you feel like you don't have enough you feel less capable of risk, which means that when you do something, you need to find a way to make it not a risk. And the only way to make something not a risk is for it to be perfect. It's not actually real, it's not possible, it can't be done, but, but that is the way you would do it. That's how you would not risk, is make something perfect. So we try to do it. I'm trying to think about my my background in poker and then getting involved in like investing. And I think initially what you do is you invest your time and energy because you don't have money. And then once you have some money, you're trying to figure out how to invest that money to generate more wealth, more options. So you can take more risks in various ways to generate more. But I'm trying to figure out how it rolls in with the notion of like perfection. It's I think well, it's it, think about it this way. So when when you first start to invest, the first thing you should do is you should invest for sixty five. You should invest for retirement. See, but that thing is, I think this the, is the thing. The reason that notion right there, that's the marathon thing, the long term. Like, because no, no. go ahead. Well, yes, yes, but but here's the thing. The thing about investing for retirement is the math is fairly well known. It's the closest thing to a sure bet that we have. So if you do that first, and then you, you, you stick to it, where it's like, okay, I'm consistently investing for my retirement, then whatever you earn on top of that, you can invest on something riskier without endangering your future. And this is doubly important because you, you are, now investing with two different strategies, but also you're investing with a different psychology because your mind knows that the future is taken care of, which means that you're, you're not only more economically capable of risk, you're actually more mentally capable of risk because your mind knows that it has something handled and that reinforces, oh, maybe you could handle something else. So it's like, you you invest for the long term and then once once you commit to that like you said you you decide on the marathon and then once you commit to the marathon and you go okay well like maybe i'll hit success at 80 if i use this pattern but i'm good with this pattern it works i feel okay then you can try some little thing here or there to get success at 70 get success at 60 get success at 50 and you slowly shorten the time scale because each decision you make for the long run makes you uh, 
stronger and smarter in the, the short run. If, if, if you do it from that lens, I, and I'm not saying it automatically happens, you, you have to cr try to do it from that lens. If you do it from that lens, then you become more capable of risk over time. Because, and what I mean by more capable of risk is you can take a risk and it won't harm you. Not long term, yeah. That, yeah, and, and that's what you have to get to. You yeah. have to, and if you don't have that, if taking a risk will harm you, you're by default going to be a perfectionist. Yep. Because, because you have to be, because you don't want to die. So the only way out of it is to figure out how to take a risk that won't harm you. And, and then, then you can let go of the perfectionism. It's like in poker, it's like, okay, a hand. You can lose a hand. Okay, a tournament. Can you lose the tournament? It's like, okay, but you've got to make moves to be able to have a fruitful career long-term play. And one of the things that happens in that long arc is pattern recognition, which makes you a better investor and it makes you a better poker player. A guy can't be playing with ace-ace every time he raises. Now, statistically, for the amount of time that he raises, what is he raising with? Okay, what are the first three cards? What is the flop? All right, the turn. Hmm, am I ahead? Am I making a good bet? Sometimes I lose a hand. Oh, no. Sometimes I lose a tournament. Oh, no. If you have a big enough bankroll, you just go up to the next level. Bankroll management, I think, in poker is like, I love poker. I, I think it's taught me so much about life in the same way that like meditation or yoga have. I know for some people, like, that has nothing to do. Like, okay, it has nothing to do with your game, <laughs> but it does mine. It's very instructive about yeah. risk management. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Risk risk management, I, I think, is is one of the roads to to dealing with perfectionism. That's a good way to put it. Like I was talking to Kristen and Kristen was worried about some graphics and stuff on a video and she's like, Oh, well, I'm a woman and people judge me. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. So I'm working with her to try to go find out, okay, so what do you want it to look like? Because now it's a design issue. She just wants it to graphically, she wants it to look a certain way. But once we figure that out, it's like more video, more video, more video. Now, what's the downside, and I'll say this for massage therapists, what's the downside of producing bad video in an industry that produces no video? Not very much. <laughs> somebody's somebody's going to call me a loser. I'm like, yeah, there are tons of losers on the internet who see a video and comment negatively or whatever, but you get to draw your people. That's like a guy talking to me. I do this with guys all the time. And they're like, oh, you know, I think this girl's nice, but I'm afraid to ask her out. I'm like, why? And they're like, well, I'm afraid she's going to reject me. And I'm like, yo, bro, if you don't put yourself in a position where she can reject you, you're also not creating a situation where she, she can say yes. That's how it works. Yeah, it's, it's that concept of <clears throat> there is a risk to saying yes, and there is a risk to saying no. There's a risk to asking, there's a risk to not asking, there's a risk to trying things, and there's a risk to not trying things. But the thing is, is when you try something, it might turn out right. Yep. When you don't try something, it will never turn out right. So here, and here's there's the thing. always more risk in terms of certainty. Sometimes there's a greater risk of, like, let's say you're like, well, let's go cliff diving today. Well, I don't know if I want to go cliff diving today. It looks kind of dangerous. Maybe I won't do it. There's risk of death, right? You know, there, like sometimes it's more extreme results you get by trying something. But be, by default, there's always more certainty on the downside risk of saying no. So it here, might be subtle. This is me. There's always that little bit of pain. Dealing with women taught me this. They taught me this, like, again, one of those life lessons. I wasn't afraid if she said yes or no. I was afraid of a year from then reminiscing back to that lovely lady that I never asked out and regret that you never took your shot when you had it. That's what, yeah. that's what, that, that's the death knells. I don't want to be old and regret at all. 
metal. Like I, I live my life in such a way that if I checked out tomorrow, I'm like, I did exactly what I was supposed to do with the time allotted. I mean, it's it's the way to go because any other route, you're consistently discontent. It's it's it's. it's I mean, pe people are it, people are constantly sacrificing themselves to the altar of low level constant pain to worship and appease the god of occasional suffering. Like, like they, they, they're, they're, they're constantly just bleeding themselves, giving themselves a slow bleed on the altar. Like, just suffering a little bit every day, because, well, you know, I don't want that big pain that might happen, that might or might not happen, and understandably so. Like, let's let's look at like what this is. Like, this is the fear of death. This isn't like some small thing. This isn't, oh, I, you know, I don't want to get rejected. The extrapolation of it is I don't want the worst thing to happen to me. So in response to my desire to not have the worst thing happen to me, I'm going to do, I'm going to habitually choose the less miserable option. <laughs> and it, it might be slightly miserable, but it, if, you know, if I have extremes, then the, the extremely miserable option might be closer to de death, because misery tends to warn us of death. Like, we have a sensation of, ooh, death might be coming. So we have to get ourselves to a point Sometimes, will we choose the more miserable option, where we go, you know what, this might be more miserable, but I'll take it. Because the only other option is constantly edging away because of that ultimate fear, and, and then like slowly moving into an area of slow, slow burn misery. Because there's never a place without misery. There's only chosen misery. And and if you're constantly running from suffering, yep. then eventually you'll get to a place of suffering that you didn't choose. And that's always more disempowering than taking a risk and, and doing something that might be painful in the short term, but could give you a, a bigger upside in the future. There is no avoiding of the, the problems of life. So much of it is not life itself, but like how we choose to deal with it. So COVID, which has been, you know, very unsettling to people of all walks of life. It's not COVID. I mean, in other words, COVID is a biological entity, is a virus, but we're in a position where how do we deal with it? And that's life. That's, that's how do you deal with it. The tire, the tire went flat on your car. Okay. Now, how yeah. do we deal with it? Because yeah. the dealing with adversity is the thing I find so um, interesting. Like, how do you handle what you consider a negative situation? How do you respond? How do you treat people? What's your emotional and psychological set? How do you deal with it intellectually? How do you, you know, and I guess when you talked about risk management, I think that is the thing about life. Like, life is risk management because the risk doesn't go away. It's not certain, right? Like, there's just, there's, you know, and in some ways, there's less risk with a 40 hour job you don't like. Now, I don't think there's as much happiness out of it, but it will give you a sense of security that entrepreneurship maybe does not. The problem is, what risk can you personally manage? And it what, can't be zero. It's not. I, yeah, I don't think it's possible. Because if, yeah. if it's zero, it's 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 the worst place to be. 
because because anything that you desire comes with risk. So if if you if you think that you want to have zero risk, then you are in constant pain because you can't move towards anything you desire. So it has to be more than zero. And and there's it, it's hard because you have to fight against the instincts to run from discomfort. Yeah. But but it ha you have to choose to go, no, no, no. I can handle some. I'm not, I can't, maybe I can't handle a lot right now, but I'll, I'll handle this. I'll handle this little bit of risk. I mean, it's like, to me, the, the training ground, it's, it's like surfing. You know, you don't start on the big waves with a jet ski, riding giants. No, you start yeah. with manageable risk. You learn muscle memory. You learn how to manage the wave. You learn how to judge speed, distance. You learn how to swim, you learn how to, oh, I hit the coral. Like, how do you manage those things? And then you gradually work your way up. At a certain point, it's not as exhilarating to ride the small waves because you've already done that. Now it's like, okay, so now it's time to bump up your, your skill level. Like being, I think people as investors, their level of risk is dependent upon their own set, like mental set, and then also on like their bankroll. You know, Warren Buffett can take risks, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos can take risks that you and I cannot. But learning risk management and then slowly, like you and I go, well, I don't know, is this gonna work? Is this gonna work? Is this gonna work? And I'm like, Eventually, I go, this looks like the best shot, go. Like, there's very little risk of me pressing record on some software and, and uploading a podcast. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. <laughs> the software died. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's not an issue in the scheme of life. People aren't going to remember the flaws in the video. People are going to remember the, the long arc and trajectory. Every surfer has to get used to wiping out. No surfer rides every wave perfectly. Sometimes the guy who can ride giants gets on the little wave and falls off <laughs> because he just wasn't good that day. <laughs> the wave tricked him. The, the challenge is, again, for me, when I talk to a lot of people, it's like I think the perfectionism is or focus on perfectionism. I sometimes think it's like it covers up for their, is it their fear of, in other words, if you don't do anything, then you don't get to find out. But you don't get a chance of losing either. And they're so afraid of losing. They're so afraid of, like, visual art. I'm not good at visual art. Happy little trees. Like, I don't take out paints and, and do it regularly. But what I do is I deny myself artistic capacity, I deny myself fun, and I never find out. But I don't have to lose, and I, I like not losing. I like not feeling like a failure. I think the perfectionism is like it's covering up a sort of psychological inadequacy. It's like, you know, just because you're, you know, good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be great at another. Just because I'm a good cook doesn't mean I'm going to be a good graphic designer. But you don't know until you try. I feel like people are using that perfectionism as an excuse not to create. I agree. I don't, want to in, I don't want to invest because I could lose money. Something as stable is like just generally the stock market. The overall market, like what is it, index funds? Yeah. Like this isn't like a yeah. single stock. The, the company went bankrupt. No, like index funds. Like we know that generally, is it like 5%, 6% return like annually? Do you know? Average? Eight. Eight, okay. So it's like Eight. that's fairly Eight. consistent. Eight. And some people are like, no, I could lose money. And I'm like... Yeah, okay. Now, statistically, yeah, we had a war, you know, over lost, over the last hundred years or so. It can yeah. generally, yeah. but it's like if you're trying to avoid risk, it just means doing nothing. And I don't see how that's even remotely happy. Risk management is like the term that keeps sticking in my head, but the notion of perfectionism, and I see it so much in video production because I'm working with people 
small or, or small time massage therapists trying to build their businesses. And again and again, it's like, one, they want it to be perfect. And then two, the reason they want it to be perfect is because they're afraid of other people's judgment. And I'm, I'm like, guys, listen, people are losers. There's a whole lot of losers on the internet with access who just sit on their couch and don't, don't ever do anything because they're afraid of other people judging them. I would much rather have a bastion and fan base of haters, so to speak, than do nothing and completely be silent, not make an impact on the industry. Like that's the loss to me. It's not, well, Robert wore a t-shirt we didn't like. His skin broke out in, one, in class. It's like, oh, those old videos, he was like burping all the time. It was gross, you know. Like I'm not worried about their judgment about one day of my life. I'm worried about my judgment of the entire arc of what I created in the long haul. And that sense of perfectionism for me is just, I don't know, I, I just don't live there anymore. Like when I start talking to students and we're shooting video for them or working with video production, I see their emotional and psychological stuff coming out of that. Like, oh, you know, people are gonna judge me. And I'm like, you're worried about an industry full of people who don't make video judging you for the videos that you make? Really? I think I think I I, I got I got one one last thought on it, I, and that's that's I think another element of it is that we think that we're more powerful than we are, or, or we want to think that we are, and uh, there's actually a use in realizing that no, you're not that powerful, and what I mean by that is we think that we can define the experience more than we think we can. We we think that by our you know, graphic design choice and our little edit here, our little edit here, there, we're, we're really defining the structure of what ha has happened. When really the, the majority of the work has been done by the sheer act of creation. And I think it's it's something that we, we hang on to because we don't want to realize that, you know, we're not that powerful. But when we, when we do, we can get out of the way and we can go, well, I know that I can't really define this as much as I think because I don't even fully understand what I'm making because I'm seeing it from a first person point of view and other people are going to see it from a third person point of view. Like I'm not even going to know what I'm creating to some degree. And then you can kind of step aside a little bit and you can start to just make things and, and take pleasure in the, the process. And, and I guess, I guess one, one more thought to tie in a little bow is I liked your surfing analogy because it was built under the concept of playfulness, right? Because it's like going back to some of the other things we talked about, it, it's, it's like, okay, so, so learning something cold is kind of step one, just kind of memorizing something and noticing that it's there. Something new, existing, that's step one. But Step two is iteration, exploration, repetition, dealing with the, the boredom of trying it a couple more times than you think you need to, seeing different facets of it, coming up with new ideas based on it, all of these things. And that's really just not an option without play. It's not an option without having that desire to explore, which comes from play. So I'd say that's that's just one other element of it in, in getting is the getting out of the perfectionist game is start playing the game where you're you're taking something that you can do okay and then just playing with it. Yeah, I mean, from an art standpoint, it's kind of like I, I would look at somebody maybe like Picasso in his earlier years, you know, with with paints on a, on a canvas, and then thinking like TikTok. This is not the same canvas. Like this is such a quick, repeated iteration. Like, well, like I almost make stuff yeah. for social media and go, how can I fuck this up? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah. I, I made videos on TikTok and people were like, yo bro, why is the video? I'm like, dude, cause I'm playing with software and I sized it wrong. And I'm like, so what? Like nobody gives a shit. Like I don't have to make a TikTok perfectly. That's not, no, that's, that's old, that's dead. Let's not even, 
remotely the long arc. The, the game is like playing with stuff and like figuring the edges of the software in my case. You know, at what point does the, the software not allow me to do the podcast? I push it too far. I mess up an audio source or who knows what. Like, you know, when you're painting, you're, you're painting for the given parameters of that canvas. You know, painting an icon is different than painting a 30 foot long canvas. Yeah. You got to be willing to let the canvas define some of the experience because you're not God. You got to be willing to like see the canvas and be like, well, what can I do here? Yeah. I'll just, I'll just do that and we'll see what happens. And hopefully maybe I can try and have fun too. Yeah. Yeah, trying to, like, I bring up a lot of jazz analogies like Coltrane, because you have to learn scales, but then you got to improvise and play jazz. And I posted a quote from Coltrane that was like something about only if the feeling is right. Like, how does it feel? Like, I'm not a, a musician the way you are, Josh, so I can't break things down mathematically according to, like, theory in music. What I do as an outside observer is go, how does it make me feel? How does the, the sound, the, the tone, the syncopation, the rhythm, the, how does it make me feel different rhythms? You know, I would listen to lots of different music and then over time it was like, well, who cares what other people like? What do you like? I like George Jones just as much as I like Coltrane. Different rhythms, it touches me in different ways. But it just depends on if there are enough fans for that thing that they're creating and how much time should be spent on a level of what you consider perfectionism. Yeah, that's that's one of my big big struggles. I I I still I still mess that one up all the time. Is I mean there's a point where you gotta let it go. There's there's a point where it's time to move on, and it's it's hard to find, hard to find, but it's for sure, it's got to be somewhere along the lines of, you work on it for as long as it makes you better, and working on the next thing would be less valuable in working on the thing that you are working on now. And that's rarely the case because most of the time finishing a project and working on the, the next project is the fastest way to learn something new. So learning to focus on, on production is just enormously valuable. But I, th I think I'm, I'm running out of steam here. <laughs> uh, you got more endurance than me. No, oh, I, I just I do this all the time. This is just me having a conversation with you. So if I, we, need, if, more, if, I need more practice. If we had to sum up, people are dealing with attraction and aversion. I think they have an attraction to perfectionism because perfectionism reduces their sense of risk. Like they can't fail at something if they never try. I think that I think I mean the sensation of not being able to risk inspires perfectionism. I think knowing that you don't have much, which means that you could lose it and it would be really bad, I think that tends to make people have, be more perfectionist. If they hang on to what ego they have left, they hang on to what resources they have left. I think that's it. I might have never explored that concept before. 
I, from a social media standpoint, judgment, man. I, I see it again and again with people, other people's opinions. Yeah, oh, yeah. lots of people who are just losers. I mean, I remember uh, Gary Vee yeah, saying if, this. If somebody has really low self-worth, if they have really low self-worth, they feel very incapable of risking social judgment. So they will put enormous effort into appearing in a way that will meet the approval of the masses. And then somebody that feels that they has higher self-worth, that feels that they can risk judgment, they don't, they don't need to be as perfectionist about it. Yeah, it fits in that frame. I mean, the creation capacity we have, like, is so outstrips. I mean, so you and I are both on computers, and we press some buttons to make a podcast. One of the things I think is so interesting is you have almost more opportunities to judge yourself than at any time because you're able to create oh, so, yeah. so much media at such a more rapid pace. Like, when, you know, Van Gogh was painting, it was like one painting at a time. If Van Gogh was alive now and he had access to digital media. Also, how many paintings did he have to compare himself against? Dude, I don't even know. I don't even... Far less. Like, I don't... I mean, I guess in museums, if he... Yeah, I don't even know, like, his... Yeah. I don't know art history enough to know, like, his background or maybe what he was influenced by. So he had, he had far less things to cast judgment on him. If you don't take risk, you can't win. You don't ask her out, she can't say yes. You don't invest, you're never gonna like have your interests accrue. Your investment, what is your your events your your investment? It appreciates. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. It just increase. Cool. So, Josh, you said you were winding down. I wanted to make sure people know. Just underneath Josh, you can follow him at Josh Terry Plays, either on TikTok or Instagram. I've got my other social media shares on here if you want to follow me. Do you like when people, like, private message you? Yeah, you can DM me on Instagram, Instagram? Josh Terry Plays. Okay. And then mostly these days, Josh, like, you're just doing a lot of coaching for people, mindset stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm working on the book and coaching. Uh, it's mostly based around dealing with a lot of things like what we just talked about, I think trying to sort through that psychology-based, emotional-based dilemmas a lot of time for, for business owners, you know, that, yep. that kind of feel. Cool. Well, listen, guys, uh, thank you so much, Josh, for uh, chatting with me. We should do this again on another topic. Thank you all for tuning Great. into the podcast. I'm going to go ahead and upload this when I get a chance. You guys have a great day, and it was really, really great uh, talking with you again, Josh. Thanks for having me on.